Mystery Theater. This week from Vancouver, The Adventure of the Noble Bachelor by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for radio by Otto Lowy. Ah, oh, Holmes. Yes, Watson. There is a very fashionable epistle with a huge crest on the envelope addressed to you. The morning letters, if I remember right, were from a fishmonger and a tide waiter. Yes, my correspondence is certainly the charm of variety. <laughs> and the humbler are usually the more interesting. Mm. Well, it uh, may prove to be of something of interest after all. Oh, not social, then. No, distinctly professional. And from a noble client? One of the highest in England. <laughs> Dear fellow, I congratulate you. I assure you, Watson, without affectation, the status of my client is a matter of less moment to me than the interest of his case. Oh, oh, quite. It is just possible, however, that that also may not be wanting in this new investigation. You've been reading the papers diligently of late, have you not? I've had nothing else to do. Look at that huge bundle over there in the corner. I read nothing except the criminal news and the agony column. The latter is always instructive. But if you've followed recent events so closely, you must have read about Lord St. Simon and his wedding. Oh, yes, with the deepest interest. It is well. The letter which I hold in my hand is from Lord St. Simon. Oh, really? I will read it to you. And in return, you must tell me what you remember. Now, this is what he says. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes... Lord Backwater tells me that I may place implicit reliance upon your judgment and discretion. I have determined, therefore, to call upon you and to consult you in reference to the very painful event which has occurred in connection with my wedding. I will call at four o'clock this afternoon. Yours faithfully, St. Simon. It is dated from Grosvenor Mansions, written with a quill pen... The noble lord has had the misfortune to get a smear of ink on the outer side of his right little finger. Well, he says four o'clock. He'll, he'll be here shortly. Quite. Uh, let's see, what is that? There was a notice in the personal column of the Morning Post that a marriage had been arranged and uh, would take place between Lord Robertson Simon, second son of the Duke of Balmoral, and Miss Hattie Doran, the only daughter of Aloysius Doran of uh, San Francisco. I see. Anything else? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, there was another note in the Morning Post to say that the marriage would be an absolutely quiet one, that it would be at St. George's Hanover Square, and that the party would return to the furnished house at uh, Lancaster Gate, which had been taken by uh, Mr. Doran. I see. And, and two days later, there was a curt announcement that the wedding had taken place, and that the honeymoon would be passed at Lord Backwater's place near Petersfield. Those were all the notices which appeared in the papers before the disappearance of the bride. Before the what? Hmm? The vanishing of the lady. Oh? When did she vanish, then? Why, oh, yeah, at the wedding breakfast. Indeed. Well, this is more interesting than it promised to be. Quite dramatic, in fact. Yes, it, it struck me as being a little out of the common, you know. Yes, they often vanish before the ceremony, and occasionally during the honeymoon, but I cannot call to mind anything quite so prompt as this. Uh, pray, let me have the details. Well, I warn you, I, I don't remember all the details. Uh, let me have what you do remember, then. Oh, now, let's see. Um, well, it appears there was some little trouble caused by a woman who endeavoured to force her way into the house after the bridal party, alleging she had some claim upon Lord St. Simon. I understand she was ejected by the butler and the footman. Yes. Uh, well, then the, the bride sat down to breakfast with the rest, then complained of a sudden indisposition and retired to her room. She was away so long that her father followed her and learned from her maid that she'd only come up to her chamber for an instant, caught up an ulster and bonnet, and had left the house. Well, Doran got into communication with the police, and uh, I understand energetic inquiries are being made, which will probably result in a speedy clearing up of this very singular business. Any mention of foul play? Well, there are rumours. It's said that the police have caused the arrest of the woman who caused the original disturbance in the belief that... Um, jealousy or some other motive, she may have been concerned in the strange disappearance. I see, and is that all? I see. Oh, uh, one little item in another of the morning papers. What is that? That uh, Miss Flora Miller, the lady who caused the disturbance, 
It was formerly a danseuse at the Allegro, and that she had known the bridegroom for some years. There were no further particulars, and the whole case is, as far as I know, it is in your hands now. And an exceedingly interesting case it appears to be. I would not have missed it for worlds. Oh. Uh, there is a ring at the bell, Watson, and as the clock makes it a few minutes after four, I have no doubt that this will prove to be our noble client. Oh, well, I do I... not dream of going, Watson, for I very much prefer having witnesses, if only as a check to my own memory. Oh, very well. Good day. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I presume? Uh... In, in here, please. My name is Lord Robert St. Simon. Oh, good day, Lord St. Simon. Uh, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, please, please take the basket chair. Uh, draw it up a little to the fire and we'll, we'll talk this matter over. Thank you. A most painful matter to me, as you can most readily imagine, Mr. Holmes. I have been cut to the quick. I understand that you have already managed several delicate cases of this sort, sir, though I presume that they were hardly from the same class of society. No, no. I am descending. I... I beg pardon. My last client of the sort was a king. Oh, oh really? Oh, I had no idea. And which king? The king of Scandinavia. What? Had he lost his wife? You can understand that I extend to the affairs of my other clients the same secrecy which I promise you in your... Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. Oh, oh very right, very right. Uh, I'm sure I beg pardon. As to my own case, I am ready to give you any information which may assist you in forming an opinion. Thank you. I have um, already learned what is in the public prints. Nothing more. I presume that I may take it as correct... The article, for example, as to the disappearance of the bride. Oh, yes, yes, it is correct as far as it goes. But it needs a great deal of supplementing before anyone can offer an opinion. I think that I may arrive at my facts most directly by questioning you. Pray do so. Thank you. When did you first meet Miss Hattie Doran? In San Francisco, a year ago. You were traveling in the States? yes. Did you become engaged then? No. But you were on a friendly footing. Oh, well, I was amused by her society, and uh, she could see that I was amused. Ah. Uh, her father is very rich. He is said to be the richest man on the Pacific Slope. And how did he make his money? In mining. He had nothing a few years ago. And then he struck gold, invested it, and came up by leaps and bounds. I see, I see. Mm. And now... What is your own impression as to the young lady's, I beg your pardon, your wife's character? Uh, well, uh, well, you see, Mr. Holmes, my wife was 20 before her father became a rich man. During that time, she ran free in a mining camp and wandered through woods or mountains, so that her education has come from nature rather than from the schoolmaster. Yes, yes. On the other hand, of course, I, I would not have given her the name which I have the honor to bear had I not thought her to be at bottom a noble woman. Have you her photograph? I, uh, I brought, um, I brought this locket with me. It contains an ivory miniature of her likeness. I see, thank you. Yes. The young lady came to London then, and you renewed your acquaintance. Yes, yes, her father brought her over for this last London season. I met her several times, became engaged to her, and have now married her. She, she brought, um, I understand, a, a considerable dowry. Oh, a fair dowry, uh, not more than is usual in my family. And this, of course, remains to you since the marriage is fait accompli. Oh, <laughs> I really have made no inquiries on the subject. But very naturally not, of course. Uh, did you see Miss Doran on the day before the, the wedding? Yes. Uh, was she in good spirits? Never better. She kept talking of what we should do in our future lives. Indeed. Well, now, that is very interesting. And on the morning of the wedding? She was as bright as possible, at least uh, until after the ceremony. And did you observe any change in her then? Well, well, now, to tell the truth, I... I saw then the first signs that I had ever seen that her temper was just uh, a little sharp. Mm -hmm. oh, the incident, however, was too trivial to relate and uh, can have no possible bearing upon the case. 
Oh, pray, let us have it, though, for all that. Oh, it is so childish. She dropped her bouquet as we went towards the vestry. She was passing the front pew at the time, and it fell over into the pew. There was a moment's delay, but the gentleman in the pew handed it up to her again, and it did not appear to be the worse for the fall. Yet, when I spoke to her of the matter, she answered me abruptly, and in the carriage on our way home she seemed absurdly agitated over this trifling cause. Indeed, indeed. Uh, You say that there was a gentleman in the pew. Some of the general public were present there. Oh, yes, yes. It is impossible to exclude them when the church is open. This gentleman was not one of your wife's friends? Oh, no, no, no. No, I call him a gentleman by courtesy, but he was quite a common-looking person. Ah. Uh, Ladies and Simon, then, uh, returned from the wedding in a less cheerful frame of mind than she had gone to it. Now, what did she do on re-entering her father's house? I saw her in conversation with her maid. And who is her maid? Alice is her name, but she is an American and came from California with her. The confidential servant? Yes, Yes, a little too much so. It seemed to me that her mistress allowed her to take great liberties. How long did she speak to this Alice? Oh, uh, a few minutes. You did not overhear what they said. Ladies, Simon said, uh, she said something about jumping a claim. She was accustomed to use slang of the kind. (laughs) I have no idea what she meant. Oh, (laughs) American slang is very expressive sometimes. And um, what did your wife do when she finished speaking to her maid? She walked into the breakfast room. On your arm? No, no, alone. She was very independent in little matters like that. Then, after we sat down for ten minutes or so, she rose hurriedly and muttered some words of apology and left the room. She never came back. But this maid, Alice, as I understand, deposes that she went to her room covered her bride's dress with a long ulster, put on a bonnet, and went out. Quite so. And she was afterwards seen walking into Hyde Park in company with Flora Miller, a woman who is now in custody and who had already made a disturbance at Mr. Doran's house that morning. Ah, Yes, yes. Yes? I should uh, like a few particulars as to this young lady and um, your relations to her. We, um, we have been on... uh, a very friendly footing for some years. Yeah, oh, Flora was a dear little thing, but exceedingly hot-headed and devotedly attached to me. She wrote me dreadful letters when she heard that I was about to be married, and to tell the truth, the reason why I had the marriage celebrated so quietly was that I feared lest there might be a scandal in the church. She came to Mr. Doran's door just after we returned, and she endeavoured to push her way in, uttering very abusive expressions towards my wife, and even threatening her, but... I had foreseen the possibility of something of the sort, and I had two police fellows there in private clothes. They soon pushed her out again. Did your wife hear all this? No, thank goodness she did not. And she was seen walking with this very woman afterwards? Yes, sir. That is what Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard looks upon as so serious. It is thought that Flora decoyed my wife out and laid some terrible trap for her. Well, it, uh, it is a possible supposition... You think so, too? I did not say a probable one. Uh, But uh, you do not yourself look upon this as likely. I do not think Flora would hurt a fly. Still, jealousy is a strange transformer of characters. Uh, And now, Lord St. Simon, I think that I have nearly all my data. Uh, May I ask uh, whether you were seated at the breakfast table so that you could see out of the window... We could see the other side of the road in the park. Ah, quite so, quite so. Then I do not think that I need detain you longer. I shall communicate with you. Uh, Should you be fortunate enough to solve this problem, Mr. Holmes... I have solved it. Uh, What was that? I say that I have solved it. Where, then, is my wife? Uh, That is a detail which I shall speedily supply. I am afraid that it will take wiser heads than yours or mine. I bid you goodbye, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Do come in, Lestrade. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Holmes. Hey, there are cigars in the box. Very much appreciated, Mr. Holmes. Good afternoon, Dr. Watson. Good afternoon, Inspector. Oh, what's up, then? You look dissatisfied. And I feel dissatisfied. This infernal St. Simon and marriage case, I can make neither head nor tail of the business. Oh, really, really, you surprise me. Who ever heard of such a mixed affair? Every clue seems to slip through my fingers. I've been at work upon it all day. Very wet, it seems to have made you. Yes, I've been dragging the serpentine. In heaven's name, what for? Uh, you think that the serpentine plays no part in the matter? I think it's very unlikely. And then perhaps you will kindly explain how it is that we found this in it. One wedding dress of watered silk, a pair of white satin shoes, a bride's wreath and veil, all discolored and soaked in water. There's a little nut for you to crack, Master Holmes. Indeed. You dragged them from the serpentine? No. They were found floating near the margin by a park keeper. They have been identified as Lady St. Simon's clothes. And it seemed to me that if the clothes were there, the body would not be far off. By the same brilliant reasoning, every man's body is to be found in the neighborhood of his wardrobe. And pray, what did you hope to arrive at through this? At some evidence implicating Flora Miller and the disappearance. Oh, I'm afraid you will find that difficult. I'm afraid, Holmes, that you're not very practical with your deductions and your inferences. You have made two blunders in as many minutes. This dress does implicate Miss Thora Miller. Oh, and how? In the dress is a pocket. In the pocket is a card case. In the card case is a note. And here is the very note. Listen to this. You will see me when all is ready. Come at once. F-H-M. Now, my theory all along has been that Lady St. Simon was decoyed away by Flora Miller and that she, with Confederates, no doubt, was responsible for her disappearance. Here, signed with her initials, is the very note which was no doubt quietly slipped into her hand at the door and which lured her within their reach. Very good, Lestrade. You really are very fine indeed. Uh, let me see it. Mm -hmm. This is indeed important. Ah, no, no, you find it so. Extremely so. I congratulate you warmly. Uh, what, you're looking at the wrong side? Oh, on the contrary. Uh, this is the right side. The right side? You're mad. Here is the note written in pencil over here. And over here is what appears to be the fragment of a hotel bill, which uh, interests me very deeply. There's nothing in it. I looked at it before. October 4th, rooms, eight shillings. Breakfast, two and six. Cocktail, one shilling. Lunch, two and six. Glass, sherry, eightpence. I see nothing in that. Very likely not. It is important, though, all the same. As to the note, uh, it is important also. Or at least the initials are... So I congratulate you again. I've wasted time enough. I believe in hard work, not in sitting by the fire spinning fine theories. Good day, Mr. Holmes. And we shall see which gets to the bottom of the matter first. Oh, just one hint to you, Lestrade. I will tell you the true solution to the matter. Lady St. Simon is a myth. Hmm? There is not, there never has been, any such person. As I said, good day to you, Mr. Holmes. Well, 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 well. Yeah, there is something in what the fellow says about outdoor work. So I think, Watson, that I must leave you to your papers for a little. I can only hope you've brought me here for some good reason, Mr. Holmes. I think that I heard a ring. I expect my housekeeper is out. If I cannot persuade you to take a lenient view of the matter, Lord St. Simon, I have brought an advocate here who may be more successful. Uh, Watson? Uh, yes, yes. Perhaps you would be so good as to show our visitor in? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, uh, this way, madam. Thank you very much. Lord St. Simon, allow me to introduce you to Mrs. Frank H. Moulton. Well, I... But I think you have already met. Well, I, I, I really think this is a... You're angry, Robert. Well, I guess you have every reason to be. Pray make no apology to me. Oh, I know I've treated you very badly, but I was confused. Perhaps, Mrs. Moulton, you would like my friend and me to leave the room while you explain this matter? Perhaps we've had just a little too much of secrecy over this business already. I think I'll tell you my story right away. Thank you. Pray do, madam. Well, Frank and I met in 84 in McGuire's camp near the Rockies where Daddy was working a claim, and we were engaged. Then Daddy struck a rich pocket and made a lot of money, while poor Frank had a claim that petered out and became nothing. Well, Daddy wouldn't hear of our engagement lasting any longer, and he took me away. Where 
If I may ask, did he take you? San Francisco. Thank you, madam. Now, pray continue. Well, Frank wouldn't give up, though. He followed me there, and he saw me without Daddy's knowing anything about it. We got married right away, and then Frank went off to seek his fortune. And what did you do, Mrs. Moulton? Well, I went back to Daddy. The next I heard, Frank was in Montana, then New Mexico. A little later, I saw a newspaper article of how a miner's camp had been attacked by Apaches, and there was my Frank's name among those killed. Well, I fainted dead away, and I was very sick for months after... When I recovered, we came to London, and my marriage to you, Robert, was arranged. Well, Daddy was very pleased, but I felt that no man on earth could ever take Frank's place. Still, if I had married you, I'd have done my duty by you. I went to the altar with the intention of making you as good a wife as I was able. But just imagine what I felt like after the ceremony when I saw Frank standing and looking at me from the first row. I... I quite understand, madam. Well, I thought it was his ghost at first, but when I looked again, there he was still, with a kind of question in his eyes, like he was asking me whether I were glad or sorry to see him. Then I saw him scribble on a piece of paper, and I knew he was writing me a note. As I passed his pew on the way out, I dropped my bouquet by him, and he slipped the note into my hand when he returned the flowers. It was only a line asking me to join him when he made the sign. Of course, I never doubted for a moment that my first duty was now to him. And I decided to do just whatever he wanted. When I got back, I told my maid. Perhaps that was the right moment to have consulted Lord St. Simon. Well, I know I ought to have spoken to him. But it was impossible before his mother and all those great people. Well, I just made up my mind to run away and explain it afterwards. Well, I hadn't been at the table ten minutes before I saw Frank out of the window on the other side of the road. He motioned to me, and then he began walking into the park. I slipped out, put on my things, and followed him. Some woman came, telling me something or other about Lord St. Simon and herself. Seems like you had a little secret of your own before our marriage, Robert. Well, Frank and I got into a cab, and we drove to some lodgings he'd taken at Gordon Square. And that was my true wedding after all those years of waiting. You see, Frank had been a prisoner among the Apaches, and he escaped. Finally, he followed me here and, and found me on the very morning of my second wedding. We had a talk as to what we should do. I was so ashamed that I wanted to vanish away and never see any of them again. It was awful to think of all those lords and ladies sitting around that breakfast table waiting for me to come back. Uh, not a very inspiring sight, I, I grant you, madam. I am sorry about that, but I'm afraid there was nothing I could do about it. Anyway, Frank took my wedding clothes and things and made a bundle of them so that I wouldn't be traced and dropped them somewhere where no one could find them. It's likely that we should have gone on to Paris tomorrow, only this good gentleman, Mr. Holmes, came round to us this evening. Though how he found us is more than I can figure out. Well, now you've heard it all. I know I've caused you pain, and I'm very sorry. But I hope you won't think ill of me, Robert. It is not my custom to discuss my most intimate personal affairs in this public manner. Oh, I had hoped that you would have joined us in a friendly supper. There you ask a little too much. I may be forced to acquiesce in these recent developments, but I can hardly be expected to make merry over them. I think that, with your permission, I will now wish you all a very good night. Well, my dear Watson, the case has been an interesting one. Because it serves to show very clearly how simple the explanation may be of an affair, which at first sight seems to be almost inexplicable. Mm -hmm. From the first, two facts were very obvious to me. One, that the lady had been quite willing to undergo the wedding ceremony. The other, that she had repented of it within a few minutes of returning home. Obviously, something then had occurred during the morning to cause her to change her mind. Now, what could that something be? Well, she couldn't have spoken to anyone when she was out, for she'd been in the company of the bridegroom. Huh? Uh, had she seen someone then? Well, no. If she had, then it must be someone from America. 
because she had spent such a short time in this country that she could hardly have allowed anyone to acquire so deep an influence over her that the mere sight of him would induce her to change her plans so completely. Mm. You see, we have already arrived by a process of exclusion at the idea that she might have seen an American. Quite, quite, quite. When Lord St. Simon told us of a man in the pew, of the change in the bride's manner of so transparent a device for obtaining a note as the dropping of a bouquet, of her resort to her confidential maid, and of her very significant allusion to claim jumping, right, which in minor parlance means the taking possession of that which another person has a prior claim to. Oh, I see. And the whole situation became absolutely clear. She had gone off with a man, and the man was either a lover or was a previous husband. The chances being in favor of the latter. But, Holmes, how in the world did you find them? Oh, now, that might have been difficult. But friend Lestrade had information in his hands, the value of which he did not himself know. The initials were, of course, of the highest importance, but more valuable still was it to know that within a week he had settled his bill at one of the most select London hotels. Holmes, how did you deduce the uh, select? By the select prices. Oh, I see. Yeah. Eight shillings for a bed and eightpence for a glass of sherry pointed to one of the most expensive hotels. There are not many in London that charge at that rate. No, that's quite right, yeah. Now, in the second one, which I visited in Northumberland Avenue, I learned, by an inspection of the book, that Frank H. Moulton, an American gentleman, had left only the day before. And on looking over the entries against him... I came upon the very items which I had seen in the duplicate bill. His letters were to be forwarded to 226 Garden Square. And that is where I found them. Amazing, my dear Holmes. I invited Mrs. Moulton to meet Lord St. Simon here, and, uh, as you see, I made him keep his appointment. But with no very good result. His conduct was certainly not very gracious. Ah, uh, my dear Watson... Perhaps you would not be very gracious either if, after all the trouble of wooing and wedding, you found yourself deprived in an instant of wife and of fortune. Oh, yes, I see. That's I the think point. that we may judge Lord St. Simon very mercifully and thank our stars that we are never likely to find ourselves in the same position. <laughs> yes, of course, I do. <laughs> well, now, my dear Watson, draw up your chair... And hand me my fiddle. <clears throat> For our only problem we have still to solve is how to while away these bleak autumnal evenings. Uh, there you are, my dear Holmes. Thank you, Watson. Mm -hmm.